Okay, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, apparently, we're doing one meetup per day now. Uh, <laughs> thinking big. Uh, it's good for our sort of performance reviews. So, it's. Uh, I, I want to say it's good to be back, but I want to sleep. That's that's all right now. Uh, I think it's actually. Uh, yeah. Well. Uh, I think it's. Uh, well, yeah, it should be. I think you're the only one who's been here three times, two times at the meetup thing, and, and one thing talking to the, the people upstairs. Uh, not God, slightly <laughs> below. This is the final, this is the third. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, three strikes and you're out. Uh, so given uh, Daniel's employer, I'm, I'm wearing this T-shirt as an homage, of course, the dinosaur. Um, I, I was going to make some crack about extinct, but I'm not going to go with it. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it's really good to have Daniel back. And, and I've actually had the opportunity to see this presentation before as well. Um, so we're, oh, some mandatory question. Who's here for the first time? That's a lot less people than yesterday. Did you say? <laughs> it's not OK. So we're going to do this for about 45 minutes, something like that, uh, presentation, and then a number of questions. Um, I realized I forgot some Chromecast somewhere. And um, and after that, you're, you're free to go. Or stick around and, and mingle in the kitchen and talk or ask questions about curl and, and the support for Priuses. Uh, whatever you feel is sort of Instagram. Sort of <laughs> <laughs> so uh, perfect. Uh, and uh, well. I guess you know drill by now. You have toilets out there. Um, if it's there's a fire, try and jump over the poor guy there. Uh, and that's it. Have a good time. Daniel. Hey. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to do this in 45 minutes. So, But um, feel free to interrupt, ask, or uh, make me repeat myself, or clarify, or whatever. Um, um, and I'll try to explain. I'm going to talk about HTTP2. Uh, from uh, the big perspectives and the small ones. I'm Daniel. I started working on HTTP uh, back in 1996, and that turned out to be the tool curl, which is a library as well, and really slow updates. Um, so I started to uh, curl really long time ago, and I've been working with HTTP, and I've been working in the IETF since about uh, eight, nine years ago. And these days, I'm employed by Mozilla, and I'm working with Firefox and uh, Firefox networking, so HTTP stacks and, and stuff. I've been doing a lot of um, talking about HTTP2 lately, but it <clears throat> uh, never mind. That's me. Uh, so I, I'll try to um, go through a little bit about HTTP today, some basics about HTTP2, and a little bit about how it looks like today on um, deployment and whatever, how it works and how many are using it uh, or not, and a little bit how to how you could deploy this yourself, and uh, uh, some stuff about the future if I can talk fast enough. <clears throat> so looking back then, the internet of today is more like the uh, 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 Wi-Fi. Uh, so, we have HTTP for basically everything. We have built an entire ecosystem where we use HTTP a lot, much more than we anticipated and, and what HTTP was designed for a very long time ago. And, and you know, even the basic stuff, even the web that the HTTP is perhaps most known for is, has changed significantly since the 90s. You know, we didn't have style sheets. We didn't have anything. We, we did have JavaScript, but it was really basic. And, it was mostly a, a picture and HTML. <clears throat> it's not the same thing anymore. Today, we have uh, seen over the last four years a 25% growth in number of objects per site on average. On average, we're going up to 100. Well, actually, we're above 100 per, in average now in requests per site. <clears throat> the, the data asked for on these average sites has grown on these same four years, like almost tripled in four years. So we see a lot of data and a lot of requests, number, a lot of objects requested on, on the average site. And in fact, uh, on an average website, we ask for more than 50 objects or resources from the same domain. And I'll <clears throat> come to why that is sort of interesting. 
uh, this taken together, then we have a lot of connections per page, roughly 40 on average. This lovely delay on that one, not that one. Um, uh, so yes, we have a um, sort of we're exploding in number of resources, num uh, data, and number of connections. <clears throat> so that's sort of what uh, what HTTP gives us, and HTTP as a protocol is. Um, is what I call the round trip bonanza. It's a lot of back and forth. So we have this guy, is an internet user, that's me, and there's the cloud on the other side. If, if we're looking through time, then when we're talking HTTP, we're sending a request, and we don't do anything with the request until we get a response. You know, send it and we get it back. And we don't send another one on this connection until we got the response. And then we ask another one, and we get back, and we ask another, and we get it back. You know, a lot of different, a um, lot of time gaps here. We're waiting when we sent off the request. The server is not doing anything when it sends off its response, and so on. There's a lot of gaps in time here when, when nobody's doing anything. And of course, we compensate this by doing a lot of these at the same time. So we open up more connections at the same time. But still, this is what the protocol looks like. It's not very effective. It's not very efficient use of TCP. This also makes it very sensitive to latency, of course. We're sending, we're getting back, sending, getting back. So if you're having the same site on a really uh, fast internet, low latency, we can have a very, really fast page rendering, but just moving away the server, uh, adding round trip makes the site slow. It really doesn't matter that much anymore if you have bandwidth or not. Bandwidth is not the problem here. Round trip is because we're adding so many back and forth. It's... And uh, not, to, uh, not to be forgotten then that the speed of light yeah, is still sort of an unsolved issue. <laughs> that speed of light is still an issue here. The world is still as big as it was before, really. It's, it's a big world. So uh, talking to the other side of the globe, takes a lot of time. We really can't fix that. So, and, and the speed of light is slower through fiber. So we're still talking about, in, in, the, in the best case, it's like 130, 40 uh, milliseconds to the other side of the globe. And, and um, we don't use the shortest distance. And we add a lot of buffers along the way. So we don't really get this. So whatever we do, and we add radio networks. Bah. So whatever we do, we end up with a lot of, of latency. I don't know why that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that just broke. Um, it doesn't matter. Several hundred milliseconds. It's, it's glitching for me. <clears throat> so whatever we do, we do have a lot of time, a lot of latency to the furthest away website or site, whatever it is on the, on the internet. We can't solve that. It takes a lot of time. We have to work around that. We have to work with that. But then we also have another problem in HTTP that we have this um, head of line blocking that we're calling it. So we have connections in HTTP or we have TCP connections that we do TCP um, HTTP over. Like this, uh, they're standing in line in the supermarket. You all know they have this problem, you know, you're standing in line in the supermarket. Which line is the fastest? You know, it's never the one you pick. And it's the same thing sort of with HTTP. We have connections, you have to queue up your connections, uh, sorry, you have to queue up your requests on connections, and you get, or you risk getting blocked by the one ahead of you. And that is especially uh, notable if you're using pipelining in HTTP, which in, um, is sort of a, one of those failed HTTP features, uh, HTTP 1, I should say. All of these things are sort of problems we have with HTTP, but of course, when faced when facing problems, we come up with workarounds. Of course, creative people have uh, invented many fun workarounds. We have a lot of problems, we fix them with workarounds. So we can, for example, then we put all images on the site in one, right? Just ask for one image and you get 220 flags at once. <laughs> That's perfect. It's a little bit shame when you have a site, when you only, when you only wanna show like three of these flags or if you wanna change one of them, you have to update every one of them. So of course it's highly ineffective at times, but you do this to sort of work around the, the latency problems. You get a lot of flags for just one request. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, or you do it like this. You just inline the entire thing in your style sheet. Why not? That's a nice blob, right? Blah. And I had to cut it off to just make sure that this is... <coughs> this, is um, this is also another way to then just inline your icon in the style sheet, and you'll get the style sheet and a lot of icons or images at once. One request, a lot of images to sort of combat the latency problem. And of course, you do the same thing then with, with, um, when you have a JavaScript. You do then, bam, everything you ever wanted in one huge thing. So you use that everywhere, no matter if you actually need that everywhere or not. And it's, uh, it's not good for caching, and it's not good for when you want to update only a part of that, or whatever. And it's also sort of all these tricks are sort of also cumbersome for the developers. You actually have to do all this every time you build and deploy your site, and you have to debug this and work with this and cut out that little flag in your style sheet and whatever. <clears throat> and when this isn't enough, you know, you have you've put all these in line and, and uh, everything, you've concatenated everything, you'll still end up with. Yeah, your site is still only getting six connections per host name, right, from the browser. Um, so you invent a lot of new host names so, so that the browser will use six connections to each of these host names. <clears throat> they call it sharding. So uh, instead of six connections, this, was, this will then make it like 42 connections to this site. And of course, you do this because you want to have a lot of parallel uh, transfers. For example, if you're uh, heavily into images or whatever, like this site actually is, you know, one of these um, tabloid Swedish <laughs> things. Uh, so anyway, these were um, the problems, the workarounds. And to fix this, this guy uh, was invented. Or actually, this guy wasn't invented, but uh, HTTP2 was. Um, and HTTP, HTTP 2, of course, is the result of sort of a long history of, of HTTP that started back in 1996, when, when the first, the year when I started working on curl, actually. But I had no idea about the process behind it. Uh, so 1996 was the first time we, uh, there was a specification for HTTP, HTTP 1.0, a bit uh, naive. So, they updated it the year after, and then again two years after. And uh, this has been the doc, uh, specification then that we have sort of lived with uh, for a very long time since then. It turned out that HTTP became a very popular protocol, as you all know. And it turned out that uh, the specification, it was only like 160 pages, a really long thing. But it turned out that there was a lot of areas in there that people really didn't agree on. What, do, what did they actually mean in the specification? We did this and they do that. Who's right, who's wrong? So in 2007, the IETF working group, HTTP BIS, started working on a, a, a refreshed, an updated version of HTTP 1.1, the specification. Started in 2007. We need this because there are so much interoperability problems, blah, blah, blah. 2009, then Google announced Speedy as a sort of a way to accelerate the web and make things faster and present things to users faster. <clears throat> Two years later, they serve um, Speedy from all their services and they uh, support Speedy in, supported Speedy in Chrome. Uh, this was still ongoing then, that work with the 1.1. And the 2012, the IETF, um, the working group, the, still the same working group, HTTP, they started working on HTTP2, which basically was a work that started from the speedy work. We took the speedy, the latest speedy draft, copied it, renamed it to HTTP2 draft zero, and started working on it. And while working on, on HTTP2, we uh, finished the update to 1.1. It took seven years, and it grew in enormous amounts. It turned out to be five RFCs now. I think it, yeah, it's about four times as big as the previous one. HTTP is not a simple protocol. It's immensely complicated. And uh, don't go there. Um, 
And then, right, and um, it only took them to 2015 until we got the RFC 7540, which is the uh, main specification for HTTP2. There's also 7541, which is the sort of uh, companion RFC. I'll, I'll get to that too. So we had all those problems. We had the workarounds, and HTTP2 was brought in to fix some of them. So HTTP2, that's just the new framing layer. We still have everything that is HTTP. We just changed the framing layer. And I'll show you or explain how, how, how it works then. We maintain everything that is HTTP. Everything that you learned, everything that you know, everything that you think is HTTP is still the same, basically. We still do get uh, responses. We have headers and bodies. We bum, 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 the same things. You can still imagine HTTP the same way. We, have, we remain having the same URL else, your eyes, whatever you want to call them, address bar items. <clears throat> we can't change them. You know, we can't invent an HTTP2 column slash slash. Nobody would want that. We would get flamed and chased out. <clears throat> so they're still there. Um, we sort of acknowledge the fact that HTTP 1.1 has been around since, uh, as I said, the, the latest update, or the first one was from 97, so it's soon 20 years. It's still uh, uh, the major uh, version that is around on the internet, so it's still it's going to be here for a very long time. It, it won't go away anytime soon. And also, therefore, we have sort of come to terms with that HTTP2 was made to be able to get proxied back and forth. Hopefully, in the long run, we will at some point, or you all will at some point, just realize that we will put everything that is left 1.1 and put it behind the HTTP2 proxy, and the whole world will be HTTP2. But that'll be a long time from now. <clears throat> we sort of also uh, acknowledge the fact that we're nowadays, when we're making protocols, we are conservative in what we accept. You know, this old liberal in what you accept and conservative in what you send? None of that anymore. We're conservative in what we accept, and we're conservative in what we're sending. So we, we have a, a protocol that is has it's not completely out of optional parts, but we've really worked hard to <coughs> remove all the optional parts. Optional parts, they, were, they, they are really what has been plaguing the HTTP 1.1. It's really uh, what plagues anything that is protocols. You should never, ever have optional parts, because that means a great deal of people and implementations will just leave out uh, those parts. And then years later, when they're trying to start to implement them, it doesn't work because we never really tried that out or really never agreed to how it actually worked and so on. <clears throat> That's also why HTTP2 is HTTP2 and not HTTP2.0. There's really, you either comply and you support it or you don't. There's no sort of middle ground there. There's no dot zero. There will never be a dot one. There might become a HTTP3, but there will never be a 2.1. <clears throat> HTTP2 is binary. And that's just um, a big difference to what the HTTP 1.1 is, text-based ASCII thing, or text-based at least. Um, you can't do any more telnet tricks, you know, telnet to the host 80, get slash, blah, blah, blah. Not that anyone actually is <laughs> doing that anymore, but people still try to think of that. Nostalgic reasons. Uh, doing things in binary is, of course, much easier implementation-wise. It's much easier to know when things end when you talk binary. There's a size. You know how many bytes they follow. There's no way to sort of... You don't have to read uh, how to deal with padding spaces. Can there be commas in your numbers? What about whatever? <clears throat> much easier. Finding the end of a response is actually one of the biggest problems in HTTP 1.1. Uh, it's a mess. So this is how a, a packet looks like. It's basically just a size and an ID and the flags and the packet. Just, and there's, of course, a lot of frames. And really, you're, nowadays, we're talking about TLS and compression anyway. So even if, you would, even if it isn't binary in HTTP 1.1, you really can't just watch the traffic, I mean, in your ordinary protocol analyzer anyway. So there's a very good um, uh, Wireshark inspector, for example, to analyze your HTTP2 traffic. It makes it really nice and easy. 
and there's a bunch of uh, these are these frames and there's a bunch of different frame types then of course and the 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 ones that are perhaps most uh, interesting or more most familiar with the old style of HTTP is that there are headers and data. There are basically headers and body as uh, in HTTP 1 land. Uh, uh, frame with headers and there are frames with data. <coughs> there are a couple of other frames too, but not that many, not that complicated. And of course, then having binary frames. Sorry. Uh, go ahead. I was confused. Uh, if you go back one, is, is there a missing bit? The flags and the... <laughs> Good observation. I can give you a little rant about certain programming languages without an unsigned type. <laughs> <laughs> you can all figure out what that language is. You know what is the <laughs> what is the biggest number you can express in 32 bits? It is 31 bits, if you're asking. So, so that's the that's the bit. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, so yes, that's a bit not used. <laughs> the bit we don't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, so, so we're having binary uh, frames then. So there are frames that are coming with a certain size and they're sort of split up so we can do multiplex things, which, which basically means that we can do a lot of streams over a single physical connection. We're sending a lot of these frames all over the TCP or TLS. We can do a lot of streams, and we're agreeing at, at a, a, we're agreeing to a number of maximum parallel. I mean, the maximum number of streams you can have a, a live at the same time. The other side, and you agree on that. It's sort of a negotiation, and that basically means that you're if you're having a stream, you're sending one image, perhaps a train, as in multiple frames, but one stream, and you're having, have, we're having another stream that is another train, another number of stream, uh, sorry, a number of frames, and they're sent then over the same connection, so they're just, we're intermingling the different frames for the different streams on the same connection. And now I'm going to do an experiment. I haven't explained this concept before, that I'm going to try to explain to you now, so bear with me. <clears throat> In this world of HTTP2, I, I explained before how we've gone to a world when everyone is trying to add more connections, you know, sharding, 42 connections. There are sites with hundreds of connections because you want to blast as many images as possible at the same time. But um, in HTTP2, we're trying to come back to one connection per site. So we have connection coalescing. That means sort of bring them back. To one. Here's me. I want to watch uh, a website. So there's a website there. Happens to be an icon you might recognize. But okay, uh, I, there it has two IP addresses. Might not actually have these in reality, but it's a sample. Uh, so we connect to this site. There's a, one as an example. Uh, a web browser doesn't actually use one, but it'll start with one. And it'll get a certificate for this site because we're talking HTTPS, of course. So that's the certificate. So and I want to go, go browse another site. And I do another um, DNS resolve. I get another set of um, IP addresses for that site. I can connect to that site. And I can get an, a certificate for that site. But wait a minute. <clears throat> they have an IP address overlap. We imagine that they also share the same subject alter alternate names in their certificates. That is, if they're actually the same site, they will have this, or they will have that to a certain, uh, a good chance that they will have that. So that is sort of clues for the browser that these are actually the same site. And forget about these icons because those are not the same sites, but it could be any random sites that you're going to. Or, or typical um, CDN sites that could host a, a lot of different sites. They could still announce the uh, a whole bunch of subject alt names in the certificate. They're sharing IP addresses, and then we can share the uh, TCP connection unsharded. That means that all those 42 connections to express them, they can actually end up as one in HTTP2, assuming that these conditions apply. 
the goal then being that we should try to keep this one TCP connection. One TCP connection per site can actually be one TCP connection to uh, multiple sites, actually. Um, uh, so how in this picture, how this, can you go to previous picture? How oh, this connected with a uh, ge geographical locality? What if for uh, web servers with one, two, three, four, for example, in US, and uh, for other servers, they are like in Europe, and I'm from Europe, so better for me probably connect to. Yes, that's why you shouldn't sort of exclude one of these connection <laughs> conditions. It's very important that you're looking at both conditions at once because it's not going to happen that you're having these uh, distributed globally. Or I shouldn't say, if you're, you're for having that, you're actually putting your site on a global sort of scale. But that's not how, how sites work today. So th this isn't really, uh, I mean, I'm. I guess I'm confusing you by using these silly uh, icons. I shouldn't do that. But in, in general, this, this is going to be the same site. They're just using sharding. They're just adding a bunch of domain names for their own site. They have invented 22 domain names. They, the, it's still the same site. The, the trick here is for the browser to just recognize that they are the same site so that they can actually ask for everything over the same single connection. That's the beauty of it. The CDNs will match into this because if you're having CDNs, they're actually hosting multiple sites for you. And they're all, all sort of the same origin for those sites. You can just as well use one connection for 22 different sites if they're all 22 different sites are hosted by the same CDN. So yes, it'll work perfectly for CDNs as well, as long as they're sort of claiming to take care of that host name. In the in the certificate and by IP address. It's sort of magic. You you don't really have to. <laughs> we don't have to dig into that too much. Um, okay. So one TCP connection, and and then since we're having then these multiplex con uh, connections, we can utilize the bandwidth much better because when we're sending these requests, we're still having you know this back and forth as I said before. But when when we're doing this now. We're having back and forth, but before we get that response, we can send another request. And we can send, that might take a long time, but we can send a third request. We don't have to wait for anything. There's no, there's no waiting times here. We can just saturate the bandwidth in both directions, really. We can just pump out everything we want to do right now. We don't have to wait. So there's much, uh, much less waiting. So, and th that's also a sort of much better way to use the bandwidth. And um, since we're having streams here, many individual streams, each basically each resource we're getting, each image, is each HTML, style sheet, JavaScript, whatever, everything is its own little stream. And it'll just be that stream, and then it ends, and then you create a new stream. So it'll be just an endless number of streams, and you can have m very many in parallel. Actually, the, the default is 100 in most servers. <clears throat> you can easily erase that to 1,000 parallel streams. But OK, we're having many streams. But having many streams also sort of makes it difficult, because a lot of chaotic different streams doesn't always help. Thus, we, ha we have dependencies. You can say that one of these streams is depending on another stream that should complete before this stream, a sort of a hint that you want to finish that one first before this, as a hint to the server to send me all of that before that so that the server can know which one to prioritize. And that's more important than the other one. Perhaps the HTML is more important than the image, or the style sheet is more important than the JavaScript, or whatever. You can hint that in a protocol to just tell the server that this is the, the dependency chain. We want to do it. <clears throat> we can also say that uh, these ones are the priori prioritized ones, or perhaps the not prioritized ones. If we want to do, um, I want to have an upgrade download in the background, maybe that's not prioritized. You can just put it a little time slice, and then the server will know that this isn't that important. The other ones are the important ones. So if there's a combat for, for bandwidth, we'll prioritize the important ones, and let the less important ones have, have a few, less bandwidth. 
and we can also sort of within this protocol then um, have um, we, we also have flow control so we can actually consume the streams at different speeds so if which makes a lot of sense if we're for example having a proxy speaking hp2 you can have clients talking through over the same connection but we're consuming streams at different speeds so you want to tell the other end this stream is slow this stream is fast so you can hold on this one come this one and so on <coughs> So we're having um, everything binary and fine, and we're having frames, so why not add header compression too? Header compression is not something that existed in uh, one at one. Headers, since headers are the same thing in HTTP2 really as in HTTP1, we're only adding framing here, we're just munging everything. It's still the same headers. So we're having huge headers that are mostly uh, repetitive and they're very big at times very, very big. It makes it real, also since uh, HTTP um, is really meant to be uh, stateless or rather very little state at least. So the client is always repeating headers. So every request means a lot of repeated headers, mostly the same as the previous request. So it makes it great for compression. And since in 1.1 .1 we didn't have a header compression, so we could easily just have multiple kilobytes of uh, headers that just went out and fill up the uh, connection. And doing header compression is uh, particularly important in the beginning of a connection since we're having a slow start when you're opening a TCP connection. We're having just a little bit of data to be, uh, send before, uh, uh, well. So it's very important in a way to, to uh, merge, uh, compress your initial requests so that you can actually get out as many requests as possible early on. And um, compression, compression and HTTP and compression and um, TLS has been a sort of a sorry affair in the last couple of years since there's been a number of different attacks on that, uh, crime and beast being two of them. And one of, one of the reasons why HPAC was introduced and which is the header compression algorithm is a way to sort of avoid the uh, attacks on compression when you're sort of sending known text and figure out uh, how it changes the output. Perhaps the biggest thing that wasn't in 1.1 one one was this, is the server push, which is, which is a way when, when this guy is talking to the cloud and is asking for, give me something like HTML, sort of the standard uh, HTTP thing, or for browser at least. Okay, and then it sends data for you. But hit, uh, the server then figures out that maybe maybe the, serv um, the client wants more, so it sends another thing. The client hasn't asked for this, just you might want this. Here it is. Server push, so the uh, server sort of thinks that the client might want this and it sends it. Avoiding um, half a round trip, and um, in this case, the CSS might ex be exactly what the client wants when it's asking for the HTML. So why not send it? And it's sort of the way. What, you know, when I showed you all those funny workarounds, HTTP 1.1, you ask for one thing, but you get a lot of different flags at once, or you ask for the style sheet, but you got all the images bundled. This is sort of the HTTP 2 approach to the, to the same thing. You ask for one thing, but you get some other stuff as well. If you accept it, you can easily just deny it or turn, turn it away fast if you don't want it. <clears throat> so how do you get to HTTP 2 from HTTP 1? We're using HTTP colon slash slash URLs, as I told you, um, and you all know. We, we won't change those. And HTTP, 1, HTTP colon slash slash URLs they're going to be assumed to be one HTTP one talking servers. And if you want to um, upgrade to HTTP two on a, such an a URL, you're adding an upgrade header in your request. And if the server speaks the new protocol, it'll switch to it and you'll be fine. No browser will do this because this is HTTP colon slash slash. It means that there's no TLS here. So the browsers won't speak HTTP two. As easy as that. 
The protocol is, of course, specified to work uh, on over plain TCP, but uh, no browser will speak plain TCP uh, HTTP 2. They will talk only HTTPS. I'll get to why in a second. But then to negotiate HTTP 2 over an HTTPS uh, URL, URI, I can never really uh, decide what I should call them. They really neither or nothing. They're just mush. <clears throat> um, so doing this over HTTPS is much easier. In, in for HTTPS or TLS, um, they invented a new extension. They actually invented another extension for Speedy. So there was another for Speedy, but let's not go in there. Uh, so there, um, they standardized this ALPN, Application Layer Protocol Negotiation, which is a way to, as an application, say that I want to speak this protocol behind TLS. So I can speak these protocols. Which one do you prefer? You say to the server, and the server says, ah, I want to speak this one. And then you go on your merry way, and you talk to the protocol. It's actually very simple, and you don't lose any um, latency. Uh, there's no back and forth. You just included that in the handshake anyway. So it's um, as fast as whatever it is, it is anyway with TLS. And we're talking about um, HTTPS only HTTP2 from the browser side. The browsers aren't the only one talking HTTP, of course. So there's more than just browsers, but I work for a company that makes a browser, and uh, I would say that HTTP2 has been developed with a lot of browser focus. I mean, we're, all of these problems and the workarounds, they're all sort of browser and uh, web-oriented problems and workarounds and fixes for this. <clears throat> so why, don't, why do we only do it over HTTPS? <clears throat> For example, if you're trying to make a new protocol today in the world and you're starting to talk with TCP on port 80, and you go out in the world and trying to make this work, you'll learn that there will be a large percentage of little boxes in between you and the destination that will help you and uh, ruin your traffic if it's not HTTP 1.1, because they will think it's 1.1. So they'll replace stuff fix things and change things for you. And you may not notice when it's HTTP 1.1 because that's what they talk. But if you're talking something else than 1.1, they'll insert 1.1 stuff in your not 1.1 traffic and it'll be ruined. And this is a significant part of the traffic. So there, I mean, it might not be two digit percentages, but several percent of all connections are ruined by this. And also then, if you're adding, if you're doing this upgrade dance that I mentioned, you do add an upgrade header to your HTTP request, which is basically just to say that, yeah, I support it. You can switch to this protocol if you want to. That's how it's defined in the protocol spec. But then implementations came around, and nobody ever sent this header until now, right? So if you're actually trying to send this, a large percentage of all the servers will just refuse to talk to you and say, bleh, that's broken, go away. So um, that's another single digit percentage of the web that's just not going to work if you're trying to send upgrade to them. And perhaps even more important, we're all trying to go to HTTPS anyway. Maybe not all, but I am. And you should too. And HTTPS then, we're trying to sort of, when HTTP2 was defined, it says, yeah, you can do it over TCP. What if you do it over TLS? You should do it like this. So we're trying to sort of raise, raise the bar for HTTPS in HTTP2. So there's no compression allowed, which then goes back to what I said before about attacks on um, the protocol. You shouldn't do compression in TLS. Um, and some other stuff was removed. There's no renegotiation, which, which, which is another sort of vulnerable part of the protocol. Hard to do it right. That's used for uh, primarily for client certificates, uh, which so client certificates is not working really uh, on HP2. It says to be, um, you need to speak one, uh, TLS 1.2 or, or later. And there's also certain uh, requirements on the Cypher suites. 
I think it's more like a blacklist. You shouldn't use some of those. And the rest is one or two. So it's actually sort of uh, trying to leave behind some of the worst stuff of TLS. And we've had a lot of the worst stuff in TLS, I'd say. So, and I just want to emphasize then what HTTP2 is not, because it's sort of, um, it's a common mistake to think that, uh, for example, this, uh, we should uh, there's a mandatory TLS in HTTP2, which it isn't. I, I think I've been made it clear, but you will not see HTTP2. If you're using browsers, you're already using HTTP2. I can say that every one of you are using it already since a long time. But you won't see it anywhere, and um, you will only talk that over HTTPS <clears throat> because of the reasons I said before. There will be other, I mean, client libraries and other tools and everything, curl, that speaks it without TLS, but that won't be the, the norm. <clears throat> and we're not ch changing any HTTP, HTTP headers in HTTP2, so you'll still s sort of get the same headers. You'll get the same cookies, you know, the enormous ones. They're still there. <clears throat> And I've added this little fun thing. There are no web sockets for HTTP2. So if you want to talk web sockets, you're still talking HTTP 1.1. And um, that's a whole separate discussion that I'll leave for you to ponder about. <clears throat> there are a lot of implementation, uh, implementations of HTTP2, a whole bunch of them. I just want to show you a large list. Um, so there's a bunch of servers. The, the family ones uh, that everybody is using, really, the big open source ones. There are some new fun contenders that sort of H2O is a new one, traffic service, a Yahoo server, CAD is a new uh, HTTP2 server. So there are a lot of different open source ones that are supporting HTTP2 since a good while now. Uh, Lightspeed, yeah, right. And then there's, of course, the, the commercial ones that have been supporting HTTP2 now since. Uh, a good while too. Google and Twitter have been doing it for a really long time. Facebook started in January, I think. And talking about browsers, it looks even better because that's just basically all of them, unless you're using uh, something like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. This is canius.com that shows the sort of um, different browser versions and if they're supporting HTTP too. And they, sp they say that and Android browser and Opera Mini don't support it. And these numbers up there, up there are sort of their view of the browser <coughs> market and, and what, what the support is for HTTP2. But then uh, um, looking at some numbers, then HTTP2 in browsers, um, and again, then browsers only talk this about talk. Uh, over HTTP2. So Firefox does, um, in, in, the la, in the current release version, Firefox talks 23% HTTP2 over HTTP, which makes it 35% of all HTTP2 traffic. No, so, sorry, of all HTTPS traffic is HTTP2. So that's a significant portion, I'd say, a third of all the requests uh, over HTTPS. And of course, this is then sort of favoring the big sites, right? This is per traffic, per request. So all the big ones that are supporting HTTP2 is going to make a big dent in this curve, which you'll see soon. And right, HTTP2 in 85% of all browsers used in Sweden. <clears throat> and Chrome will remove it in, uh, what is it, in a month, May 15th, on the anniversary of HTTP2, they have said that they will remove speedy support. So it's sort of a speedy, sort of a dead end if you went aware of that. Right, ah, this is the speedy graph and the HTTP2 graph. Speedy is the red one and, and the HTTP2 is the yellow one, green, whatever it is. <coughs> so if you're looking at the top 10 million sites in the world, 7% are supporting HTTP2 and nine, blah, blah, blah. And so 19% of the top 500 sites clearly clearly more usage in, in the more popular sites. <clears throat> but if you're sort of switching your own site today to HTTP2, just go home and, and turn on the knob, you'll see that a majority of all your visitors are going to use HTTP2. So I said the numbers before, how many browsers that are supporting it. It really shows in the traffic as well. It's just not made up numbers you can actually verify. And of course, it'll vary on your, on your particular visitors and all of that. But 
you'll see that more than half is going to use HTTP2. All right, uh, and all these numbers, then Akamai went live um, with the, uh, they offer HTTP2 to all their customers. I guess that is going to make an impact. I haven't seen that impact yet on the numbers, but I think you need to opt in as a customer. So I'm uh, sort of thinking that it might dent the numbers over time. Um, the Google bot is said, actually they said, I don't have any updated info about, about this, but they said a long time ago that they would support HP2 in early 2016. So I think they will soon, which also is going to help uh, drive traffic or make people switch over. And Amazon CloudFront is going <coughs> to support it too this year. So there's a lot of, I mean, the big sites, Cloudflare all, already supports it, and a lot of other big CNs are, are already there. Wikipedia is already there. Uh, WordPress, everything, we're going there. So if you want to do this yourself, because that's what we want to do, right? You do it like this. You pick one of these servers. It's really easy. Most of them are there. They're, every one of those, you know them. Some of them you know. Some of them you don't, but they're all easy and fine. Uh, you can also just use one of these little fun tools to analyze your traffic, uh, command line tools. There a, you can run curl to just try out your traffic. You can run Wireshark to analyze your network traffic. You can use H2I to send uh, H2, HTTP2 frames and uh, investigate how things look. And there's a fun... Uh, Plugin for your browser called HTTP2 and Speedy Indicator that shows a little flash in your address bar and tells you which protocol your site, the site that you're visiting, what it, what it uses. Fun things. And really, that's all you need. You just need to install one of these servers, tick the little switch, and it'll be there. Because H2 is really not hard. It's really, really very easy to deploy, and you can switch it on, and it works. No biggie. H2 is not the problem for you. The problem for you is, as was the same problem as it was before H2, HTTPS. <laughs> because, ah, well, <laughs> you know, I have mixed content and stuff like that. And, and also, when we introduced this um, ALPN thing, you know, how to negotiate HTTP2 over HTTPS, we need ALPN. That's a little extension uh, that in the TLS 1.2 extension. And who supports that, right? And when did they start to support that? If you're using, for example, a language without 32-bit <laughs> integers, you're really <laughs> behind. If you're using uh, uh, an uh, operating system like uh, one of those sort of more slow-moving Linux distros, for example, you're probably using a too old OpenSSL version to have this. So there are little tiny obstacles like that. But if you're using the latest uh, OpenSSL or you know, any one of the big ones, GNU like TLS or the NSS or whatever, it'll, it'll all be there. But you know, mixed content and certificates, that's still what's, what's going to be your issue. But that's HTTPS, so I, I really can't say that's really about HTTP2. But, and of course, for certificates, you should all just use Let's, Let's Encrypt anyway. Free, simple certificates for your sites automatically. <clears throat> so if you uh, then go ahead and, and um, switch on HTTP2 for your site, because that's what you do. It's really easy. So you'll, of course, uh, you'll get a faster site. But I should, of course, preface that it'll vary. I can't guarantee any numbers here. But if you just switch your normal site, you'll get a boost. It'll be faster. I can almost guarantee it. But, and how much faster, I don't know. It'll depend on your site. It'll depend on your clients. <clears throat> you can do server push. It makes a difference if you're, especially if you're having a lot of mobile traffic, a lot of long distance traffic. And there's FGPS. And um, when you did, when we did sites on HTTP 1.1, we only had, you know, a bunch of requests outgoing at the same time. We had perhaps six connections. Well, you sharded it. We had 10 connections, 18 connections. It didn't really matter if we served a couple of JavaScripts that then asked for another JavaScript, that then asked for the third JavaScript and the fourth JavaScript, you know, ding, 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 ding. That's sort of how half the words sites are functioning today. But 
but then you're adding these uh, round trips in your sort of dependency chains on your site. Ask for that, then it'll ask for that, then it'll ask for that. You will never be get any faster than those three, four round trips. But if you can ask for 100 resources at once, it's much better to show than those, shorten those dependency graphs. The dependency suitable when you're switching to the HP2, that if you just work on your site uh, design, you can actually get things much faster. So there's a future even ahead then. And um, let me take you through that too. Of course, it's the future. I don't actually know the future, but I can tell you a little bit about what's going on. First, we're talking about improving what we're already having then. We're having HTTP 1.1, we're having HTTP 2 being deployed everywhere. <clears throat> And as I said, this HTTP2 server push, when the server sends you stuff you didn't ask for, that's an area where sort of that's a new invention. How does the server know what to push, right? What if we already had that stuff? We don't want to have it again. It's already in my cache. Stop sending me crap. I don't want it. <laughs> so there's a lot of research and, and, and tests and ideas around that, how the client should send hints to the server about what to push to make the push even better so that you could just, just get relevant data or even get relevant data faster. And there's this, I said, there's no support for client certificates really in HTTP2, and that's sort of made a significant portion of the world sad. So there's work on making HTTP2 client certificate work. We'll see about that. We're talking about improving cookies. We're always talking about improving cookies, really. So that's sort of a constant. <clears throat> but uh, but we, we might go there. And sort of cookies are a mess in general. And it's impossible to sort of change fundamentally because everyone has implemented cookies on their own. So we're really, we can never change cookies really quite a lot. We can just change it a little bit. But there's a good set of plans to at least make it better. And uh, I'm writing uh, this uh, draft TCP tuning for HTTP, more of trying to um, help out, how, um, help newcomers uh, with hint, hints and ideas and suggestions on how to use TCP better for HTTP implementations. There will be more HTTPS in general, and there will, of course, be more H2 tools. HTTP2 is still an early protocol. There are tools missing. We don't have comparisons. We don't have. We don't know all the things yet. So there's a lot of that going on. A lot of tests and research and things to figure out everything. And once we have HTTP, well, this most of that stuff, or some of that stuff at least, is going to be HTTP 1.12. I mean, cookies is going to be the same thing and so on. But at some point, we're going to look behind beyond what's H2, HTTP 2, and maybe it's time to drop HTTP 1 legacies. Uh, as I said, we, when, when H2 was designed, it was sort of decided that we should be able to proxy it back and forth. And with that decision, we had to sort of make a lot of um, compromises and say, OK, if we have to switch it back, we have to support this old craft too. Maybe it's time to cut off some of the old stuff. Maybe not. HTTP 3 will happen faster than HTTP 2. I think we all agree that HTTP 2 took a very long time to actually happen. And uh, I'm sure that now we have a lot of fundamentals put, put in place, so it'll be faster and we have a better idea of how to actually deploy new protocols or run experiments live uh, already. As, for example, this quick uh, might be a, an idea or a clue or a hint or maybe the way to do HP3. And um, and quick, I'll give you a short rundown on quick because quick is interesting, and uh, um, that's really a su entire subject of its own. But I'll run it through at the end before you fall asleep and run away screaming. Uh, we implement everything: TCP, TLS, HTTP/2, over UDP, entirely in user space on your own, right? Yes. Everything in one blob. Uh, so <clears throat> by doing this, we avoid, for example, the TCP head of, head of line blocking. I talked about head of line blocking on HTTP level before, but on, you know, when we're talking everything over a single TCP connection, what if you drop 
couple of packets in the middle, right? Everything is halted by that. So we have to sort of resend TCP packets and then we're back on track. What if you lose a couple of packets in the middle and you'll only sort of make that and punish a couple of streams of those? That's what uh, Quick ha has introduced. So a couple of missed packages in the middle, it'll, it'll only suffer, only a couple of streams will suffer. And we can also then experiment with the different congestion control systems and stuff like that. We can move traffic across interfaces much easier. So you can go from your Ethernet to your Wi-Fi to your radio network uh, completely transparently. No handoff or anything. It'll just be the same traffic. Uh, all of that is solved. And you can also do stuff like forward error correction. There are discussions if that's actually a very good idea, but might be. Um, and, and the fundamental point here is really, uh, to me, or one of the fundamental points is really that we can do TCP improvements much faster. TCP, you know, um, that's sort of kernel space code. I'm, I'm not sure if, if you're all aware how slow it moves when you want to do things in kernel space. There was this uh, spec called TCP fast open. It's, it's uh, how you do TCP and you're actually sending data earlier in TCP. You actually so, sort of pass on some data in the handshake. That was made, the, the specification was done 10 years ago. And today we're starting to see that deployed in, in the real world. 10 years. With a, with a protocol that we're sort of controlling in user space in browsers, we can sort of have a run, turnaround time that is um, magnitudes faster, if done right. Could also just break everything. <laughs> so I just wanted to repeat everything that um, I said in four lines. It's binary multiplexed. Easy, right? We're going to see it primarily over TLS. It's actually going to be so little used over HTTP. So once you actually use it over TCP in, in plain, uh, it's not going to work for you. Uh, and there won't be any two anywhere. I mean, you're all using this already. You never saw it. It's just transparently upgraded in the background or in the protocols. And there's nothing in the way. Just deploy it today. Boom. Any questions? Um, I have two questions, actually. The first one is, OK, so <laughs> if you happen to like any questions, uh, I'll put it on me. Right? No. <laughs> otherwise, Lotte ask good questions. <laughs> otherwise, Lottery and Spectrum will show up. Hmm. Um, if you don't like any questions, they roll for me. You have kids. So, <laughs> Great. So pick the best three. Thank you. Uh, well, and, and she has two. So she, yeah. No, no pressure. <laughs> Really you want to rethink that? <laughs> yes, I do. Okay, so like I said, first question, we're currently looking at if you have HTTP2 enabled, you have between 70 and 85% of browsers that are going to send you HTTP2 traffic. That's great. Problem is currently every single developer is still applying all those HTTP1 tricks. Why? For those 10, 15% of people that are insisting on sending you HTTP1. So we're still concatenating all of JavaScript, we're still aligning with CSS and so on. When do you expect that enough people have switched over that we don't have to do that anymore? Uh, yeah, good question. When do I expect that, that it switches over? Um, within a year, within two? I don't know. Uh, I think I think that the, the, the deployment rate is quite rapid, but I don't know. Maybe it's it'll slow off. Maybe people will just get stuck on that. And, and also this... Um, I mentioned all these sort of workarounds as, as funny things they do in 1.1, 1 1, but they're not all bad in HTTP 2 either. So you actually have to measure this. Because like, you know, if you put a lot of 200 flags in one image, it's actually not as bad as it sounds like, because, you know, image compression and everything, those 200 images are going to be much larger if you're sending them one by one than 200 at once. So they're not all bad. So there's been also been a lot of, you know, tests and, and checks that some of those uh, concatenations and everything is actually still good in HTTP 2. So I, I'm sure there are going to be, there's going to be a lot of more tests and more debates around when to do that and when not to do that and how to deal with the switch. Uh, so yeah, you, you mentioned a little bit about the you know, transformations on TCP and stuff and that being an issue. Uh, so let's say you have a clients that are on very shaky 
uh, internet connections. Would you still recommend using HTTP2 then? I lots of retransmissions happening. So. Yes, but, but, but no. Okay. Uh, of course, I, I would just say that yeah, you should test that out yourself. But in, in general, you're actually benefiting from using less connections than more connections when you're having a lot of packet loss. Because you'll, you'll get back faster and you'll get l less of a blowback when you, when you get back. So in general, it's better with fewer connections. So I would say in general, it's better with HTTP2. But I'm sure that there will be examples when it isn't. Yeah, um, you said when you said the TCP over UDP, that just like blew my mind. Like, uh, Lovely, right? That's on TCP though. Uh, it is. Um, I mean, uh, that sort. Of, I try to explain the concept because it's not really TCP. It's the. I mean, it's TCP-like. So it's sort of retransmission and checking data and blah blah blah. So, it's it's the same. You get the same features as TCP provides. That is not really actually TLS, and it's not really actually HTTP2 either, so, but it's sort of. I have a question uh, for the scenario that you mentioned that uh, for efficiency, the server pushes some uh, code to the... Server the push, yes. Exactly. So does that really be like a threat for the user's privacy? Uh, server push? No, no, I think server push should be seen as, as sort of the same quirky workarounds I showed as other things. It's just a way for the server to send more stuff. They could already do this, you know. They could stamp, put, put a lot of images in your style sheet, but you didn't ask for them. You got them anyway. And, and uh, they're all doing this with JavaScript today anyway. You didn't ask for it. You got it. So it's not really anything new here. And it's the, the same server. You're already talking to this server. You're already, already sort of getting what it's sending you. So it's actually not a, it's not a privacy issue. And it's not, a, it's not actually a new sort of attack surface of vector either. It's, it's basically the same thing as before with the different mechanisms. So you talked a lot about uh, browser to server communication, but uh, can you imagine some other use cases? For example, within data center, like inter data center traffic is already today using a lot of like frame based protocols. Do some of the design considerations of uh, HTTP2 change uh, with that perspective? Um, no, and I, I think that it is going to be used a lot in, in back, I mean, back behind your fronting servers. And I know that that's, that's been an area where you actually have SCTP and other protocols being popular also in, in the past. So I, I think that, and that's also where we're going to see people uh, use HTTP2 without TLS. Because if you're in your own data center, you could use it TLS less. Perhaps you could at least, but so yeah, I, I think that's going to be used. I don't think I don't think the protocol has uh, sort of taken that into account to any particular extent, but I don't think it had to either. I think it'll it'll work fine for that too. Yes, uh, on the subject of server push, how is it determined today? Is it the server implementation of? It is. Uh, it is determined uh, since um, since yeah. That's a good question. I'm trying to I'm trying to explain just the protocol parts here. And the protocol parts is just what decides. Who, and it, it, I, it, I've purposely left out the entire part about how exactly do you determine what to send in the push. And there's there's a lot of discussions about how to do that and how to control that when you're writing your content in your you're writing your site or blog or whatever. How do you actually tell your server that this data should be pushed and not asked for or pushed before asked? So yes. There, there, there's a lot of work on that, and and a lot of the. I know that at least Nginx and Apache they're using this link header as a hint. One of those uh, types you can put to the link header as a push hint. This the server det determines. Yes. The server so, so you, if you just set that to your resource, the server will try to push that. Yeah. Ah. Since, since we're both old people, and you're not going to remember all the questions, do you want to hand out one now? <laughs> I don't remember. Do I have anything? To... <laughs> you know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Uh, this is just to make you feel <laughs> Oh, I feel much better now. Um... <laughs> yes, here you are. <laughs> Thank you. Round two. <laughs> <laughs> there. I wonder if you could expand on the why you're not 
using compression what was the reason it seems like a bad thing to not the compression well compression is good since compression is used in in h pack so compression is used uh, well, sorry. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I didn't really get into that. I left that out. But uh, compression is used exactly the same way as it was used with HTTP 1.1. So you're still doing this, you know, content uh, encoding, gzip, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it's, it's content is being compressed exactly as it was with H, uh, HTTP 1.1. It's actually even more since, I mean, nowadays we actually have broadly, but, but that'll be for 1.1 too. And broadly compression is also only going to be over HPS. <clears throat> but the point with compression, the badness of compression is in the TLS layer. So that's, there's no compression in TLS. There's only compression in HTTP. Sort of a complicated yeah, issue. Below. Yes. So well, that's sort of level two course. <laughs> Would you be able to use serve and push without a request? Say so you had subscribers to something and you just push stuff out at a certain time. Uh, no, a server a server push is um, is always related to a request. It, you have to have an initial initial stream to sort of con, um, put it associated with. I should also add that when you're sending a push, you're actually the server is also saying this is the request I imagine you sent when I send you this response. <laughs> so you can actually see what kind of request it could have been that I didn't send when I get the response. Uh, oh. yeah. okay, Sorry, there's a lot of questions. I'm trying to be fair, but it's... Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, my question, I'm not, uh, probably have explained, but uh, so that it was, I didn't get it. My question was related to the previous protocol. You are sending request, it's coming back. Sending another request, coming back. But now you can send the bum 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 and can get bum bum bum. So they can be out of sync. Yes. So then then in sync. I mean making them sync. And uh, my question is actually two, but connected to the same. And another is about server push. Both add load on like extra processing or extra decision making things. Does that impact the browser capacity or browser load or browser speed or anything? Do you understand that? You mean if the added amount of requests? Add. Yeah, because when things are coming to you, so you are previously there is no decision making in terms of. Uh, no, but no, that, that's not correct because the, it was the, the same decision making was basically there before too. Because you know, I said forty two connections to express them. And you, you can easily find sites with 100 connections, 200 connections. So there are stuff coming in all the time to a browser. It gets stuff like everywhere. The difference isn't stuff coming in. The difference is just um, the fewer connections with stuff coming in. So it had to do the same things, basically. Things coming all over and you know, uh, re-rendering or not and stuff like that. It, it is the same problem for the browser. It just gets. Um, by reducing number of TCP connections, it, uh, things are easier you know, transport-wise. But not for the rendering thing. It's still the same complicated mess. <laughs> I don't do the rendering, so I can just say that it's complicated. Sorry. Um, you said something about um, the no negotiations. What are the biggest security threats against HTTP? The biggest security threats? <clears throat> I'm not really the right guy to ask about that. I don't think HTTP 2 opens up uh, much more uh, threats than before. I think that um, the biggest threats are probably that there are there are a bunch of new implementations of all these protocols. So I get I guess that we're getting a bunch of new bugs, and then just because of that, we're we're opening up ourselves. But I don't I don't think I don't think we're opening any new areas of, of, of attacks. I'm quite sure that I mean this has been security reviewed by a lot of good people. So I think I think we can be safe it safe to say that we haven't opened it up for any particularly new areas, but we're with new code of course we're getting new new problems. <coughs> Chromecast two. <clears throat> oh soon. <laughs> Let me get what that one. So you said the, there is no web software support. There is no WebSocket support on HTTP2. Exactly like, 
or or let me present an, an alternative theory you know HTTP, uh, uh, going back to when WebSockets was made WebSockets is made because you know before that you made one of these long polling requests you made a get you didn't get a response you just waited until it responded right yeah. that was terrible because you wasted one of those six connections one out of six but if you do that now what's the penalty here really so you can basically do one of these streams I can ask for this one out of 1,000 streams will just not get any traffic there's no penalty at all so you could really go back to the old way of doing things Yes, but <laughs> you can implement everything that over HTTP. That's exactly what people did before WebSockets. But I'm, I'm just saying that you could do it that way. But but the, I mean, the harsh reality is rather than nobody did the WebSockets for HTTP two because nobody figured out it was that important. So nobody has gone that road. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Server load does it go up or down? <laughs> Uh, server loading comparison to what? Uh, if you're, if uh, um, I've seen both both ups and downs actually, so I, I would say that it's roughly the same. I mean, it, it, it's some compression, so you get less data, but all you also compress more. Uh, so I mean, I, I think that'll vary very much depending on your particular traffic. So I, I don't think there's a winner here either way. So I think it's hit, hit or miss. On the topic of winners, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, didn't end up uh, sorry, sorry. So, uh, three more minutes. So, three more. speak fast. Speak fast. Ask fast. Go. Yes, about the responsibilities. When when the HTTP spec was written, was the expectation that the web service would implement the, like the advanced part or the web application developers? So, what, know, what, as a web developer, should we expect like the web server to just upgrade nginx and then everything works, or should we start to change our application to to make use of that advanced features? Um, complicated question, but I think I think um, HTTP as a sort of um, I wasn't around when HTTP 1.1 was made, or I was around, but I wasn't par mm -hmm. participating in that process. So I can't really talk about that, but. But nowadays, I think we're all aware of the role HTTP has. And so it has, HTTP 2 was designed to facilitate everything that we're doing and everything that we foresee that we will do coming next. But of course, so, so we sort of made a protocol that will enable all that. But we didn't really decide if, if that would be implemented by the server or an application in the server or whatever. It's not really, that's really beyond what we did. We just made a protocol that could enable all that. And the rest is up to everyone else. I'm trying to be fair. Sorry, go. Yeah. You discussed to attach timeouts per request, like in some telecom uh, protocols. So, a channel request with timeout, and if it's outside, then it's not valid anymore. <laughs> but that, that uh, no, it's not in the protocol. There's no time in the protocol. But it's very easy for anyone to implement. Just give it up. It's actually that's one of the benefits with HTTP two. It's so easy to just kill something. They're all streams. You know, you can all, in HTTP one point one, it was really hard to to cancel one request. Sometimes you couldn't cancel it. You had to just keep on reading it until it's done, and then just throw it away and then go on. But now we can just say, boop, go away. So if it's if times out, you can decide it times timed out. Throw it away, and it'll just move on to the next one. Last question. Up there. Uh, about the client certificate, you mentioned uh, currently there is no support for the client certificate. So how the mutual authentication is done? Client certific certificates is made by downgrading to one at one and doing everything the old style. So they are in parallel run together, or like uh, was one point one and two Yeah, they're 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 parallel. You can't mix them, so you're either or. So you're using one dot one to do one dot one stuff, and you do. So yes, the browsers that will do that will just do that connection and 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 uh, do and have a HTTP two connection separate from that. But 
then all the communication in that case would be in the previous version. So there is no. Yes. So basically, exactly. And that's why also why it's being sort of worked on to fix to get it done. But client certificates and authenticating connections. If you're authenticating a connection, that sort of goes against what I've been talking about <laughs> for an hour. You're having a lot of streams over one connection. You don't want to authenticate a connection. Then you suddenly authenticate everything over that or not. Or, well, that's sort of the challenge, one of the challenges. Oh, I think we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs>